Welcome to the introduction to Java Enterprise Edition, nowadays recently renamed to Jakarta Enterprise Edition or uh, Jakarta or Java EE. My name is Philipp Brune from Neu-Ulm University of Applied Sciences. We have already learned about the Java language and um, the Java runtime, the JVM, but uh, Java is more than just the language and, and the runtime. In fact, what we uh, typically consider uh, Java as a language is sort of the, the core, labeled Java Standard Edition, Java SE, which contains the language, the API, the libs, and, and the JVM. And um, to make Java really useful for, for enterprise computing, of course, um, we need more than that. And the next um, part of the Java ecosystem um, that extends this Java Standard Edition is the Java Enterprise Edition, now called Jakarta Enterprise Edition. And um, this was uh, originally the official Java Standard, now um, released to the open source community and further developed in the open source uh, community uh, under the, the roof of the Apache Foundation. And this is Jakarta uh, EE now. Jakarta EE is basically a specification that describes an environment for building high-level, high high, uh, mission-critical enterprise applications. And this specification can be implemented by, it's an open public specification, describing APIs, describing uh, interfaces um, that need to be provided. And um, if you sum up all the requirements in the specifications from, from Java EE, you end up uh, with something called an application server. And the application server is basically an, imp uh, an implementation of the specification. And since it's a public specification, it can be implemented by basically everyone. And there are a lot of different implementations that are all compliant to the, to the specification. Commercial ones and open ones, open source implementations. Very common ones, for example, for open source are JBoss or Glassfish. Um, JBoss nowadays called Wildfly. And there are or the Open Liberty, there are many different uh, implementations. And beyond Java EE, of course, the open source world has created a lot of other components, tools, extensions, standards, and so on, that form the Java ecosystem. So here we have the Apache projects, the Eclipse projects, we have, for example, something like JUnit, we have a lot of different IDEs, uh, we have the Spring Framework, the Play Framework, and so on. And all together is then the Java ecosystem. And if you want to use or uh, understand Java, then you basically should get an overview of the whole ecosystem, not only of the language itself. Let's have a closer look on Java or Jakarta EE. Um, as I said, implementing uh, the specification leads to the implementation of a Java EE application server. A Java EE application server is a middleware program, middleware software that um, runs on the JVM of course. It's usually it's written in Java itself and it provides an environment for building business applications. And for the business applications we need basically uh, uh, different layers. So every business application usually is organized into the, the three tiers or the three layers, presentation tier, business logic tier, and persistence tier. And the uh, persistence tier is typically formed by a database management system, can be SQL or NoSQL based, or by other kind of enterprise information system, like for example, um, uh, something like maybe an external transactional resource, transactional system, or things like that. And um, the persistence tier is there to store persistently the data, to uh, uh, store and retrieve the data. Then we have the business logic tier, where the actual business logic, the, the processing of the data happens. And uh, then we have the presentation tier, which realizes the user interface and the input-output to the user or maybe also to other, to other programs. Okay. The presentation tier is modern, in modern applications typically is web-based, using web standards, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and so on. The client is typically a web browser, and then we communicate using HTTP with the application server. The application server has uh, on the top level a web container, for example, Apache Tomcat, to implement the web profile of the Java EE specification containing technologies to create dynamic web pages like Java server pages, Java server faces, servlets, and so on. Below that is the component container. This is very specific for Java EE. 
Um, for example, you will not find a similar concept, for example, in PHP. Um, so it's a um, unique feature of Java. Of course, it's very strongly inspired by the transaction processing monitors, like ZIX, for example. Um, um, the component container runs so-called enterprise Java beans. There are also alternative implementations like the Spring Framework, which also provides some kind of component container. And the idea is that a component is a, soft, a piece of software, Java class, for example, that implements a certain business logic part or business functionality and uh, gets a lot of service functionality from the container. So the developer of the, of the business component um, doesn't need to implement trivial things by hand. So this is the fundamental structure of uh, every of a full stack Java EE application. And um, we will now have uh, a, sh a closer look on that. So what is the purpose of using such kind of framework? Java EE is sometimes criticized for being very complex and having a steep learning curve. And that is partially true, even though in, in recent years it has been simplified a lot. And um, the most recent <coughs> Developments, for example, like the Liberty or Open Liberty uh, application server, try to sort of um, reduce the complexity to the minimum that is needed for a certain application. Objective is general the, to support an efficient and, and, and therefore faster development of business applications by avoiding coding things that are already there, so fostering reuse, supporting reuse, um, and avoiding implementing infrastructure things like security, data access, and so on. So this is provided by the framework, so the developer can really focus only on the business requirements. And therefore, Java Jakarta EE contains um, a, a, a big number of ready-to-use frameworks and, and components for standard tasks, like, for example, persisting data, persistent storage, that's a Java persistence API. Transaction support, handling distributed transaction. It's a sort of a transaction processing monitor functionality that's implemented in the component container. Distributed applications, calling remote functions, web services, web-based user interfaces, all this stuff that are typical for modern applications is more or less implemented, ready to use, and can be just used by, uh, for example, configuring the server in the right way. The general idea is that Java EE abstracts a lot of the underlying soft and hardware infrastructure. For example, also from the databases and, and, and things like that. On ZOS and, and the mainframe and, and Linux on Z systems, we have uh, different possibilities to use Java EE. And Java EE has become on ZOS, beside the, the classical six applications, uh, the second most important uh, type of applications because Java and, and Java EE is a sort of a replacement, increasingly replacing COBOL and, and SIX, or combined with COBOL and SIX. So it allows to uh, build mission-critical applications and therefore sometimes takes over step-by-step, step, slowly, the, ro the role of COBOL. And this is why it's important, especially on the mainframe. On ZOS itself, now we have, for, for many years, a Java EE application server called WebSphere, IBM WebSphere. Uh, the WebSphere application server. And um, the, the most recent version is the um, WebSphere application server for ZOS Liberty, which is based on the Open Liberty um, implementation of Java or Jakarta EE. And this is a very uh, more modularized and more lightweight approach. And it uh, can also be um, embedded in inside a ZIX region, so it can be combined with classical mainframe applications like the ZIX uh, applications, COBOL, etc., to provide a, a very efficient and, and uh, lightweight interface to combine COBOL and, and Java code. So this is especially important on, on ZOS, where you have the, the classical mainframe COBOL workloads. On Linux for set systems, on the other hand, we have, um, of course, the, the full range of open source um, Java EE implementations ready at hand because they are written in Java and then they can be just used on the on the um, on the uh, Linux on set systems as well. Um, there's, for example, probably most most common one is the Wildfly, which is this n more newer version of the JBoss open source version of the JBoss application server, which is a very robust and and long time existing Java EE implementation belonging to Red Hat now. Uh, which is also used in, in commercial and in business applications in, in the industry. Then we have the Open Liberty, which is the, the open source version of the, of the Liberty uh, application server. 
Uh, Glassfish used to be the reference implementation of Java AE. And of course, Apache has a lot of projects in that direction. There's, for example, Apache Tomcat, which is only the web profile, but combined with Tommy, it's also an EGB container. There's Apache Geronimo, and there are other uh, implementations. And of course, for example, on Linux, we have the SAP Netweaver, Netweaver application server. SAP Netweaver is the foundation application server of the SAP um, suite of business applications, ERP, CRM, and so on. So it's a, the, the underlying infrastructure. And it implements also a, a JEE stack uh, for many years now. And this is also available on Linux for its set systems. In general, uh, as I said, a unique feature of, of, of JEE is the, or are the so-called enterprise Java beans, the components that are service components that are supported by the component container or live in the component container. And EGBs are server-side components. In fact, they are basically Java classes and they're objects of these classes. And they are managed by the EGB container. So the developer, for example, has not to deal with instantiation, creating objects and things like that. And they, the purpose is to encapsulate business logic, they encapsulate a piece of business logic that fulfills a certain purpose. For example, handling customer data or something like that. The EGB container provides integrated distributed transaction support to these EGBs. Uh, by, by default, every method call of an EGB is one distributed transaction. So every I.O. operation done inside this method will be belong to one transaction. In addition, the component container manages access control, has security features. For example, role-based access control. Um, so not every method can be called by every client, depending on authorization. And in general, the container provides, for example, support for turning an EGB directly into web services, SOAP or REST-based web services, um, to execute EGB methods in the background by a time control, which is kind of a batch processing mechanism, scheduling mechanism. And it supports, for example, dependency injection, resolving the values of attributes at runtime automatically without the need to, to assign values, for example, to object variables. There are different types of EGBs and three major, three major, major kinds. Um, the first are the entity beans, which are not really EGBs anymore since the EGB3 specification, but now they are just normal Java objects, basically. And entity beans describe the business objects that are persisted and retrieved from the data store. So they are the interface to the database. We have session beans, which are, um, which are the, the most important EGBs. And we have three types, the stateless, the stateful, and the singleton session bean. Um, the stateless session bean is a component that ha um, is not client specific. So every client can get for every call another uh, instance and they do not have an internal state and the client cannot rely on the internal state because you don't know which object you get the next time. Um, the stateful session being is client specific, so every client accessing the server has for during the session is always the same instance of, of this EGB and can also keep data inside the, the EGB object. And the singleton implements a singleton, so it has a state but it's the same for all clients, so it's a global object the singleton pattern as it has been specified in, in the book by, by Gamma et al. And then the third category are message-driven beans. Message-driven beans are listeners to a message queue. So every time a message comes in asynchronously, the message-driven bean gets notified and processes the, the message. And this can be used on the mainframe, for example, uh, as, a, as a listener or integrated with a message queue, with the MQ uh, product on, on ZOS. Uh, there's a JMS bridge so that uh, a Java bean can read uh, messages, for example, from the, from the MQ um, message queuing system. Finally, here's an example of a simple um, enterprise Java bean, a stateless enterprise Java bean. So the most uh, typical, most common um, type of Java beans to illustrate the, um, the concepts. So this, is, uh, this uh, enterprise Java bean class implements um, a simple bookstore functionality and it's called the book EGB and um, basically you see that it's, 
it looks like a normal Java class. It is basically first of all a, a standard Java class, standard Java code. It is marked as an EGB for the container, for the EGB container to, to be um, maintained and used as an EGB by annotations. So this is the stateless annotation that basically indicates that this class is a stateless session bean, for example. Stateless uh, annotations start in Java typically with or always with, a, with an at sign and they are kind of, uh, of markers of, of tags that um, are not really code that is executed but they are uh, used to give a hint or an information to a runtime environment, in this case the EGB container. The class has two methods, so the EGB has two methods. Uh, one is findbook and one is createbook. So it's a simple bookstore that you can uh, get books from and put books in to illustrate simple data operations. And um, in this case, uh, th this uses JPA in Java Entity Beans. The Entity Bean uh, class is not given here, but it's called the book. So we think of it as a representation of, of data of a book. And um, this, this object, this book object can be stored in the database by the create book method. So you, you uh, uh, hand over the, the object and it is persisted using the entity manager. So to insert the book in the database, to transform it from an object oriented to a database notation, regardless of which kind of database it is, it's just handled by JPA. So em persist writes this book object in the database. And um, same is with the find method. It is given uh, the ID, a uh, numerical ID, a uh, sort of primary key of the object, and we get back the full object. So JPA, as part of the, of the EGB framework, uh, turns the, the book object into a um, database representation, sends it to the database, inserts it there, and retrieves it there. As you can see, we do not have to write any kind of SQL or database query language code for that. We do not have to deal with uh, handling transaction boundaries, opening and committing a transaction, for example. This is all handled by the container. Every method of uh, an EGB, in this case the two methods here, is by default one transaction. And every data operation done inside belongs to that, it could be even a distributed transaction. So that is the transaction monitor functionality provided by Java EE. And, um, I always handled by a so-called entity manager object, which is uh, an ab abstraction of the database, of the underlying database, realized by the, the JPA, Java Persistence API framework. And um, as you can see, in this EGB, no value is assigned to the variable EM. This is not necessary because here we use dependency injection. The annotation persistence context here says, okay, and EM should be con should contain a connection or a representation of the connection to uh, a database named bookstore which has been defined beforehand in the configuration of the server and um, now the EGB container ensures that every time EM is used like here or here all automatically um, the write object is injected in the background before the call is executed so this is uh, completely transparent to the developer. What you can see here is the developer really can focus on the business logic. So he can think about, okay, or he or she can think about how to find the object, how to persist the object. You do not have to actually write the, the data operations. You do not have to write the transaction handling. So it, basically the full functionality is achieved with two, two lines of code or two, two actual two statements that do the actual work. So um, it uh, is very efficient and it reduces the, the number of lines code that developers have to write and um, allow the developers to focus on the business functionality. And that is uh, one of the main strengths of, of uh, EGB and, and Java Enterprise Edition. Thank you very much.